It's The Ruminant, a podcast about food politics and food security and the cultural and practical aspects of farming. You can find out more at theruminant.ca or email me, editor at theruminant.ca. I'm on Twitter at Ruminant Blog, and you can find me on Facebook. All right, let's do a show. Hey folks, it's Jordan. All right, so on today's episode, Steve Solomon. That uh, that ought to make lots of you happy. But before we get to that, I want to deal with this podcast tardiness issue. I'm over two weeks late with this episode. I apologize. I blame tax time and hand in your damn certification, organic certification time and just general farm craziness in April. It seems to be happening again. It always happens. But I want you to know that I have five more episodes in the bank and another three to five that I have planned that I should be able to pull off. So this year's a bit different in that I'm actually acknowledging to myself that this is going to end in the next couple months and then I'll pick it up again next year. Whereas normally I insist to myself that I'm going to keep the podcast going all through the summer. It's not a reality given how busy the farm gets. But yeah, five to 10 more episodes, some of which I am super excited to share with you. And then I'll hibernate for a bit and think of new episodes and then be back at you in the fall or winter or whatever. Okay, so on today's show, Steve Solomon. Uh, Some of you will know Steve from his writing. Uh, His most recent book, The Intelligent Gardener, is a great read and I strongly suggest you take a look. I had Steve on previously to talk about that book and I had him for another two-part episode uh, on making great compost. I get a lot of feedback on those episodes. Some of you really enjoy Steve on the show, so I'm glad that he's back. And what happened is I emailed him recently and I asked him what he's really excited about these days in the garden and he said, foliar feeding. So I said, great, why don't you come on and talk about that? One thing that happened in our conversation though is that uh, while we were talking, Steve started experiencing a very large thunderstorm and at some point the connection got really bad and we kind of had to shut things down. He then contacted me afterward to point out that there was one topic at least that we really didn't get into regarding foliar feeding and that has to do with uh, the frequency of foliar feeding that he does uh, and offered to come back on and I just never made that happen. So you're not going to get to hear uh, Steve's advice for frequency of timing of foliar feeding applications, but you are going to get to hear him talk quite a bit uh, about this. Steve is really convinced that this is making a huge difference in his garden. So Steve Solomon on foliar feeding in just a minute. But before we get to that, uh, I just want to acknowledge uh, a few people who have made donations at the ruminant.ca slash gift registry. And you know what? For some reason, I don't understand. I've just been using people's last initials as if they're in the farmer protection program, which seems dumb. So hopefully these people won't mind being the first um, people I'm outing with their full names. Eric Barnhorst, Amy Fenn, Jesus Cazares, Allison Taylor, and Dana Penrice. Thanks so much for your donations. I really appreciate it. Dana Penrice, I suspect, I suspect that's the Dana who is special friends with the one and only Ted from Alberta. So if I'm right about that, and I think I am, Dana and Ted, thank you very much. Everyone else, if you're enjoying the show, please consider supporting it. Theruminant.ca slash gift registry, where until recently you could choose to purchase for me a salmon fillet pillow. But you're too late. Eric Barnhorst nabbed that one, uh, for which I'm very grateful, as I said. Uh, But there's plenty of other great stuff on there that you can buy for your podcast host. Some of them are real, some of them are fake. The fake one, with the fake ones, I just keep the money. Let me be clear. Okay, time for Steve Solomon. Talk to you at the end. Steve Solomon, welcome back to the Ruminant Podcast. Thank you. Uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, Jordan. Steve, uh, Steve. Uh, where, where are we going to go today? Well, I, I think we're going to go to, we're going to start with foliar feeding. I, uh, I'm, um, Steve, you've been a, a popular guest on the show. I get, a, I get some good uh, positive feedback about your, the past episodes you've done with me. And uh, 
So what's happened? I reached out a couple of weeks ago and asked you what you're interested in these days. And you mentioned you've been doing um, a lot of foliar feeding in the garden. So I thought we'd talk about that. How does that sound? That sounds like a, a, a really good topic. Okay. I'm, well, I'm happy to talk about that. Okay, great. I'm just going to let you frame it. Um, the guy who put this the best way I've ever heard it uh, is a man named John Knopf, K-N-O-P-F. Uh, and I want to make sure that the listeners uh, uh, go out and check John Knopf's website, uh, which is uh, advancingechoag.com. All one word, advancing echo egg. And uh, John is uh, a crop advisor and a farmer who grew up on a vegetable farm in Ohio. Uh, I think his family raised tomatoes, among other things. And uh, he uh, is a natural genius. He, I, I think he has an ag school education, but, but I'm not sure. Uh, if he never got a formal one, he certainly has uh, the best informal one anybody could ever have. He's perfectly literate in the subject. And um, he has a network of farm advisors now. He has a business with 15, 20 advisors all over the country. Um, and they specialize in consulting people growing high-value horticultural crops. Uh, and uh, he's a manufacturer of mostly foliar feed uh, uh, supplements of various kinds. Um, and his basic principle is that no plant in any soil, doesn't matter how perfectly you fertilize the soil, it doesn't matter how balanced the soil shows on a soil test, um, no plant can get all of certain nutrients that it needs at what he calls critical points of influence. Certain periods in the plant's uh, development process uh, when it can actually use a whole lot more of some elements that it could source out of the soil under normal conditions. And these are the ones that if you foliar feed them at the right moment, you can make an enormous difference for the plant with a rather small amount of material. Okay, well, Steve, let me just try and bring this all together. So uh, a few years ago, you get talking. So no, I better go further back than that. Uh, listeners of the show uh, will know that you're, 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 you've been a prolific writer on uh, gardening, and one of your uh, your a recent book was The Intelligent Gardener, uh, which focuses well. on the soil and it bringing your soil into the right balance uh, of nutrients uh, for optimum plant health. Uh, so you you've been you've been obsessively focused on that for years, uh, and then in the last few years. <laughs> Sorry, do you, have I got? Is no, that fair? I just like that obsessively. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a. I think that's fair. <laughs> and then, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, that is fair, actually. <laughs> okay, so then a few years ago, you get talking to your neighbor with these beautiful cherries and discover mm. uh, that part of uh, what he attributes to his success is um, is a foliar spraying plan. Uh, yep. And you've also referenced this guy Knopf, uh, who is an advocate for foliar spraying. Uh, so bring us into your garden. So as, as you're processing all of this, what are you seeing in your own garden and your own plants? Um, and, and how did you, it's clear you, you're, you're interested in increasing your foliar spraying and playing around with it. So, so how did you start and what were you, what, what, what unsolved problems were you trying to solve? Yeah, very good. Good question. And, um, let me, let me um, take this back just a, a step. Uh, so there's this guy. He's got cherry trees, you see. Now, this is he's got a couple of hectares in one species. It's all on the same cycle. He's just growing a crop. Uh, he can do things with that that I, as a gardener, can't possibly do. Because as a gardener, um, I've got uh, 25 different species growing at all different stages, uh, and each one of those species is maybe in two or three different stages at the same time. Mm-hmm. I mean, I might plant carrots <clears throat> once a month through the summer, you see, and I have little carrots, medium-sized carrots, and carrots with mature, you know, large carrots under them. I've got all that all side by side, more or less. Uh, so I can know that for specific species that uh, this species uh, really likes more boron and more zinc, uh, but uh, in a vegetable garden, that doesn't work. 
So uh, as a gardener, what I have to do is that I have to use the multivitamin approach, you see, and hit them uh, with a bit of everything. Right, and you're you're just getting at how how uh, almost impossible it would be to to spray separate regimens to, you know, numerous dozens of different crops at different stages. You'd be you'd you'd work you'd, you'd work yourself into an exhaustion tr- making different sprays and timing it all right. Is, is, is yeah, and I don't think that mentally you could encompass it all. Maybe an artificial intelligence could do it. Right. I mean, who knows? Maybe someday we're going to have a little robot that flies uh, on a drone over your field by GPS and knows exactly where everything is and, and um, it has 17 different elements in little tiny tanks and sprays them out, you know, depending on what this square meter needs. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, a, like an inkjet printer. But uh, we don't have that. So, yeah, uh, you, have to, you have to use um, a, a sort of a broad spectrum fertilizer. No. Uh, here in Australia, uh, we're very fortunate, and we got a man working for us named Graham Sait, uh, S-A-I-T, uh, and uh, spelled in the British way, G-R-A-E-M-E. And uh, Graham uh, runs a company called Nutritech Solutions up in Queensland, and he's sort of our uh, John Knopf, and he's been in it for longer than John, um, and uh Graham manufactures a product that he calls Triple Ten. And uh, uh, your readers could download, uh, you know, the product sheet and analysis of Triple Ten uh, off of Nutritech's website. It's nutra-tech.com. And um, uh, Triple Ten is the most effective foliar fertilizer that I've ever used as a broad spectrum. Maybe I can talk about my soil as a specific example because, um, you see, in the last year, I've discovered the three main areas where my soil does not deliver adequate plant nutrition. And two of them I can't fix, not very well. Uh, one of them I can't fix. Let me, anyway, let me, let me just deal with specifics. Sure. I'm sitting, I'm sitting on a deposit of basalt. Um, there are, Okay, folks, so you have a choice here. For about nine minutes after the end of my little monologue here, Steve goes into detail with some examples of some of the deficiencies in his garden. After which I summarize what he just went through and we move on from there. So if you want to hear these examples and they're they're kind of interesting, he actually talks about certain crops and how they're affected by their deficiencies and then his attempts at foliar feeding, then listen to the ensuing nine minutes after I'm done talking here. But like I say, I summarize it at the end, so it's kind of your choice. And now to make all this timing work, I have to kill some time. So here is my impression of a lion. All right, if you're skipping ahead, go to minute 2250. I have uh, one plant that I've known in my garden has always been a phosphorus problem, and that's my lemon tree. And my lemon tree has got a problem. When it doesn't get enough phosphorus, um, the skins on the lemon, the the white rind around the inside juicy part of the lemon gets thicker. And I've been spraying that tree two or three times a year with a chemical phosphorus fertilizer, and uh, for the next four or five months after a spray, the lemons are better. But they've never been uh, what I would call, you know, lemons from the store. So reading the Nutritech catalog, I came on a, a form of phosphorus fertilizer that I'd never thought to try before. It's called micronized guano. And uh, what they do is they take ordinary uh, high phosphate guano that's mined off, you know, in Peru or, or Chile, and um, I'll grind it in a ball mill until the average particle size is below five microns. Uh, so I got some of this micronized guano. And uh, anyway, I worked out what seemed like a reasonable dose and sprayed it on the tree. And two days later, I saw a miracle. Um, every younger leaf on that tree, even the ones that were full sized but they hadn't been on the tree for eight months or a year or something like that, they were younger, uh, Two days later, they were 25% wider. The leaf size just <clears throat> exploded almost overnight. 
And the tree had a kind of sheen to the leaves that I'd never seen before, a kind of shining health that we can recognize, but, you know, I don't know how to exactly distinguish it. Uh, and and uh, I thought, wow, that's remarkable. Well, anyway, before you before you move on to like other problems in your soil, just, you know, OK, you you saw a, 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 an aesthetic improvement in the potatoes and the lemon tree. How what about the, the crops? How about the other crops? No, no. Just how are the potatoes? How are the lemons? Like, you know, it's one thing to oh, to uh, see to see the foliage perk yeah. up. But what about the well, the actual crop? I can't answer that question. Because it's not the only thing I did this year that was different. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I did two other things this year that resolved the other two problems that I've had. You see, <laughs> and and so now, uh, and there's been an enormous improvement in the taste of my food. Enormous. The bricks went up on almost everything. Mm-hmm. Food tastes so good in this garden, I've started gaining weight again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and... Uh, the, uh, so let me tell you the other things that I fixed, you see, because, uh, I'm not a scientist, you know, I'm not trying to prove that phosphorus does anything in particular. I'm just happy to see things get a lot better. Uh, I got another problem with my soil, Jordan, and that is that this basalt that, that was the parent material of my soil has no quartz in it. So my soil has very little silicon in it, and um, I uh, I got interested in using silicon also uh, for another crop, and I wondered what will silicon do, and um, uh, it makes branches get stiffer and stronger. It, it it's a, a core part of the structural material that the plant develops. Uh, it it also does other things. Uh, it um, Hugh Lovell uh, has a theory that silicon and boron work together in the plant to form a ladder that lifts water up through the vascular system, and that the plant is actually able to access a great deal more moisture and the nutrients in that moisture when it has adequate silicon and adequate boron. Mm-hmm. And um, that these things. Uh, generally need to be introduced through the roots and uh, especially the silicon because it's not very mobile on the plant. Neither is the boron. Uh, I think boron is slightly more mobile than silicon. Silicon is not very mobile. And um, so I got no silicon. Reading Graham Sait's catalog, uh, looking for that phosphorus, he's got another micronized product. It's called uh, Dialife. And what it is is diatomaceous earth that has been ground in a ball mill so that the average particle size is, you know, below five microns. Uh, and uh, he's added to it uh, a fairly healthy dose of boron, which is like the cofactor that goes with it. Mm-hmm. And and uh, uh, I started mixing this in my spray tank and saw the most remarkable result. <laughs> Gee, um, let me see what all the good things that happened. Uh, all the all the beans that I grow in my garden, especially the climbing beans, uh, have had a lot of trouble with wind. So my my uh, beans had a tendency to have shredded leaves and be damaged after windy days, and it would cause a lot of losses and greatly reduce production. Uh, now the wind blows after spraying silicon on the leaves a few times, and they don't shred. And better yet, um, the beans themselves now keep about 10 days in the fridge instead of starting to get soft and go off after four days. Mm. There, there's like a bit more skin on the beans. So anyhow, that's what silicon does. However, in my enthusiasm with silicon, I, I got to warn people that silicon is dangerous. Um, if you overdo it, the plants respond to it in negative ways and the leaves start getting smaller and uh, wiry strong. And um, the smaller leaves and, oh, and the, the branches 
uh, get smaller in diameter and much more uh, rigid. Uh, and I think, and the productivity of, I'm speaking of a couple of tomato plants now that I did this to, um, and then one variety in particular responded more strongly to silicon than the other, and it's become half as productive as it was before I sprayed it with silicon. So, uh, and if you've got sand, uh, if you've got silicon in your soil, uh, it might be that you don't want to have more silicon than you're getting, but it certainly is worth taking a look at. Um, so that's silicon. And uh, then my soil has another problem. Uh, now this one, I could resolve by fixing the soil. Uh, uh, my particular parent rock is rather deficient in molybdenum. So many things started doing better. It's, it's hard to say, you know, that it, uh, that it only affects one crop. Uh, Every year in the early spring, I plant onions. I grow a big patch of onions. I grow all of our onions. Uh, I grow the storage onions. I even grow a big patch of salad onions. Um, and and uh, I have an undercover area. We put away several hundred kilograms of onions every year. I usually lose half of the seedlings every spring. Uh, it's harsh. It's frosty. The soil's cold. It's not releasing a lot of nutrients. Um, the days are short, and these little seedlings come up, and they disappear. So I always compensated for that by planting a bit of more seed and sprinkling a little extra fertilizer uh, along the row right after germination, a uh, complete fertilizer. And um, I, I got a stand of onions, but I lost a lot of seedling. After I sprayed molybdenum, they all survived, and they started growing a whole lot faster uh, right from the beginning. Uh, all the cabbage family plants produced broader leaves and grew faster and tasted better. Uh, all the legumes started growing a whole lot better. I did a bit of reading and found that uh, molybdenum is key to, uh, to forming nitrates in the nodules of legumes. And if the soil short molybdenum, the, the roots will nodulate if the bacteria are there, but then they don't turn pink and they're not really making very much if any nitrogen. So the whole nitrogen formation and protein synthesis of my bean crops improved enormously from this little touch of molybdenum. And, and by the way, on a garden scale, uh, a, a, a generous slight overdose is a half a teaspoonful of sodium molybdate on 10 square meters. Okay, well, Steve, I think I want to I want to summarize this last part of the conversation and then move on, broaden out the conversation a bit. Okay, so okay. Uh, you tell me if I've got it roughly right. Uh, at some point, you kind of, uh, for reasons we've discussed, you develop an interest in foliar feeding. Uh, you partly do it to address some um, challenges with your soil that are very hard to correct. Uh, you yes. you explain why um, you will perennially be challenged with phosphorus deficiency. Uh, you've got a silicon problem, um, and then also low in molybdenum. Uh, you yep. you find a base product that is available down there uh, that gives you a nice kind of general application, and then to that regimen, you add these products containing silicon, molybdenum, and you also jack up the phosphorus by adding in this ground-up guano. And yes. your anecdotal results so far are that you've seen tremendous uh, improvements in the garden, and you yourself say you can't directly attribute it <coughs> to the foliar feeding because there's been other tweaks you've been making, but but you believe that this foliar feeding you've been doing has significantly contributed to better, healthier crops. Yeah, well, it's not that I can't attribute it to the foliar feeding, Jordan. I can't tell you which of the elements it is is doing which. Right. But so, okay. So, so, but you are, you are, a, you have, you're a convert. I mean, you, you believe that this foliar feeding you're doing is, is, is improving your, your production. Yes. Okay. So much so, so much so that uh, I'm thinking about giving up putting phosphorus fertilizer into my soil at all. Okay. So let's, let's put a pin in that. that that's, um, that'll be 
very interesting to a lot of listeners. But now let's, can we just move on to um, some of the practicalities of spraying in general, uh, in this case, foliar spraying? Um, are you using a backpack sprayer, Steve? Yes, I do. Okay. So can you talk about, in your experience, like best practices uh, in, in effectively spraying? Because um, it's easy to run into troubles, isn't it? I mean, either just... Uh, yeah, you, okay. you can overdo it. You can harm your plants if you're not careful. Well, I, I mean, putting that aside, putting aside that you have to be really careful about concentrations... Um, I yep. just mean and like, treatments. I want to start foliar spraying, you know, what's a good sprayer to get and what mistakes can I make with the sprayer that are going to reduce the impact? Do you have anything to say oh. about that? Oh yeah, I do. That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> um, like everything, it seems like there's a, uh, uh, two levels of quality. There's, uh, the consumer merchandise. And then there's, uh, you'd say, industrial quality. I like to use that term. Uh, so with your pump sprayers, it's the same thing. If you go into a garden center or a discount store and you buy an inexpensive pump sprayer, um, you're getting a device that probably isn't going to last for more than a year or two. And, uh, gosh, I bought one where the, the brass spray nozzle, the, the whole brass assembly that, that, that was the sprayer, was made out of such brittle copper that it snapped the first time I used it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it came out, came out of China. It was cheap, cheap, cheap. Uh, industrial sprayers uh, will last a long time. And with an industrial sprayer, you can buy parts. So if something goes, you can replace it. You can keep the basic thing working indefinitely. Uh, with industrial sprayers, you can buy nozzles of different sizes and that emit different patterns of spray. And this is extremely valuable when you're doing foliar feeding, especially if you're doing something with micronized mineral suspensions like this guano or these diatoms, because there will be the odd bit of grit that's a little bit bigger. And if you have a fine nozzle, it gets plugged. So... Uh, when I started spraying these, I went down to the farm supply and I bought a, a, a larger nozzle that had a ceramic uh, jet in the middle of it because I found that the, I had a larger size plastic nozzle. And after I sprayed uh, five or six tanks full of, of uh, phosphorus, in, you know, stuff including this micronized phosphorus, the spray pattern started to break apart. It's like the little particles going out of this hole in the plastic had enlarged the hole. <laughs> so Right, and doesn't uh, that ultimately matter for the plant's ability to absorb what you're spraying? I mean, isn't important the uh, the size of the uh, droplets and such that you're spraying? Do you have anything to say about not, that? Not super important. Um, it might be to a farmer. Uh, uh, there's, <clears throat> there's two basic ways that you can fully your feed. Uh, we, I have two different targets. Um, one way of thinking about it is I want to spray so many, so many kilograms of this material per acre. Okay. So how many liters of water uh, does it take for me to cover an acre? So I get these um, <clears throat> misting nozzles, nozzles that produce a very fine mist that use not much water so that I can get coverage over, say, a whole acre with 100 liters of water. And I know that my brig is putting out 100 liters to the acre, so I put so many kgs of this fertilizer into 100 liters of water and go and spray my acre, and the acre gets that coverage. But every every piece of leaf doesn't get covered. You're not getting 100% leaf coverage. Yeah. Yeah. So your main concern when you're doing that is what concentration can you use that will not damage the plants? You want to make it pretty strong. But, uh, you know, you don't want to overdo it. So that's one approach. The other approach is the home gardener's approach. Uh, and you go out with a backpack sprayer or a pump sprayer, and you spray the plants until water drips off of every leaf tip. And uh, when you do that, you're using a great deal more water. And you should probably use a lower concentration than your fertilizer. Mm. Yeah. So... Um, uh, with uh, Triple Ten, for example, this one I mentioned from, from Nutritech, 
uh, the bottle says, the 20 liter container says, uh, spray, uh, uh, spray this at 10, 10, 10 parts per hundred, uh, per thousand. Put in, you know, 10 liters in a thousand liters. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and spray the field. Uh, and you're right. Uh, <clears throat> but on a home garden scale, if you do that, especially if you do that more than once or twice, uh, you you can burn plants. So I found that seven mils to the liter is much more comfortable for this kind of spray. And, and back back to the to the sprayer. When you say an industrial sprayer, I mean, do you have any brand examples? Um, yeah. Or, or types yeah, I, to look for? Yeah, I, I I probably don't have access to uh, as many products as uh, as people in North America think, but. Uh, uh, one of the ones I've had really good results with is made by a company called Solo. Okay. You know that one? Yeah, I th I, I believe that's the brand that I have. I, I haven't seen it in a while. Yeah, they're so. they're German. Mm -hmm. uh, real high quality gear. Uh, and uh, there's another company that uh, is sold here in Tassie called Chapin. Uh, and uh, there's another one called Matabi. Uh, yeah, Annie had one of those for a whole lot of years. They were pretty good. I never had a Chapin, but they look pretty good in a shop. Um, and I would suggest people get one of those. I've also got a, a, a seven liter pump sprayer that, you know, a hand carry one that's also made by Solo. And it's useful sometimes if I don't want to spray that much. Um, they all allow you to change the nozzle. Um, I think. I think that uh, uh, most of these sprayers use the same nozzle size. So uh, you can pick up nozzles for one sprayer and they'll generally fit in another. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, but the, a big takeaway point, it seems, Steve, is, is for people who want to try this to proceed with a little bit of caution in terms of the concentrations that they're, they're experimenting with and uh, perhaps uh, start by in a given, if they're going to try spraying, do it on half the crop and, and, and be able to compare, you know, differences between, between, you know, your, your, uh, the sprayed, the sprayed region and the unsprayed region. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. And you know, this brings to mind, um, something maybe we should suggest to people what they actually try mm -hmm. in North America. Um, uh, you know, I moderate a, 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 a Yahoo conversation group called soil and health. And um, there's 2,000 subscribers. And, and uh, uh, when I started on this folio route, I asked people, what can I recommend to North America? And uh, we did quite a study of what's the products that are available there. And so I'd like to suggest a couple of products. Please that, do. Uh, I, don't think, yeah, I don't think either one of these are near as good as Nutritex Triple Temp. Uh, but they're the best I could find. Uh, and frankly, there'd be a good market for somebody in North America to find out what Graham Sage is up to and more or less replicate something like that in, in, in that market. Um, anyway, um, the easiest one, the easiest way to, to find out what foliar will do for you is to go to a garden center and buy, and I'm sorry to mention the name of this company, because it's almost as bad as saying Monsanto. <laughs> uh, but uh, Scott's Miracle Grow. Okay. An evil conglomerate, which is setting out to gobble up the entire horticultural industry all by itself. <laughs> okay. And has been doing that ever since the 1980s, at least. Uh, uh, buying one company after another that has a similar product and then just putting them on a business. I've, I've seen them do that. Uh, anyway, uh, just the ordinary miracle Grow is based upon a, uh, a formula that I believe was created by Victor Tygens a long time ago. And Tygens is the man who more or less invented hydroponics. So... Uh, and you can buy a half a kg of miracle Grow for a few dollars in a garden center and mix it up at the concentration they say on the box and, and spray it on your plants. Um, so that's a, that, that's kind of a good entry level test case for people just to, just yeah. to, be able to see the results. Yeah. Yeah. See what it does. 
and and uh, there's one uh, trick that helps a great deal with products like that, and that farmers use something called a spreader sticker. Uh, this is a basically soap, and um, it lowers the surface tension of the water and allows the droplets to spread out on the leaf surface rather than beating up and running off. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the reasons that I wasn't too concerned about what size the droplets are or how much leaf coverage you get when you're spraying. Because if you're using a spreader sticker, it tends to spread out even if the droplets aren't kind of large. Um, anyway, um, there's no need to buy a spreader sticker. Uh, everybody has one. It's called dishwashing detergent. And uh, you just put two or three drops to the liter of whatever your dishwashing liquid is. Uh, and if it, you put it into the tank first, and if you make any foam by the time the tank is filled up, you use too much. And uh, this, this greatly increases the effect of the fertilizer. A, a better fertilizer uh, is um, made by a company called Dynagro, D-Y-N-A-G-R-O. And um, they have uh, several different formulations that they make. Uh, two of them are uh, made with the cannabis growing market in mind. Um, so they have like a, a bloom formulation, which is high in phosphorus and potassium and rather moderate in nitrogen. And they have a grow formulation, which is uh, high in nitrogen uh, and more moderate in the other things. Um, <clears throat> and they have a more utility one that's closer to gram say it's triple ten that they call triple seven 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 uh, and all of these are heavy with trace elements they have effective levels of trace elements uh, in fact that's another thing I should talk about in a minute it's, I'm sorry, I apologize I haven't got all this written out in perfectly logical sequence for you um, anyway um, I would suggest that you get uh, people get a liter or so of Triple seven, and uh, from Dynagro, and uh, I think it's a better formula than Miracle Grow. And um, Dynagro stuff is half the price of what you'll find in a hydro shop. It's it's actually quite moderately priced. You can buy triple seven by the two hundred liters, you know, by huge barrels. Uh, by the thousand liter shuttle tank, I think, if you want. Farmers use this sort of stuff. And it's available in Canada. And Steve, what about, and I'm thinking of the organic growers among us, myself included, what about, there are a lot of products that are kelp based. And do you have anything to say about those as, as potential foliar feeds? Oh, uh, look, here's, here's the thing about liquid fish and liquid kelp. Uh, uh, you, <clears throat> liquid fish, uh, contains a lot of nitrogen in very useful form and a little bit of phosphorus and uh, some trace elements. But uh, if you ever saw an analysis of the trace elements on the label, and I've never seen it, I mean, we know they're in there, but um, the quantities are so small that they're not effective. Uh, if, if you want to see what an effective quantity of trace elements is in a, in, a, in a foliar feed, take a look at the Miracle Grow box or read the analysis on, on Dynagro 777 and see the concentrations of zinc and copper and manganese and boron and so forth that are, that are in that solution. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you, you take a look at some other products where they list them and you'll find that there's a hundredth as much. Right. It's detectable in the laboratory, but it's not effective. Mm -hmm. So um, the same the same is true of kelp. Um, a liquid kelp has a fair amount of potassium in it, and a little bit of phosphorus, and a little bit of nitrogen, and uh, ineffective levels of trace elements, and low levels of micronutrients. Um, um, I think it's important to make a distinction between micronutrients and trace elements. The names are sometimes misapplied. Uh, um, trace elements are copper, zinc, manganese, boron, and iron, uh, and molybdenum. And these things are generally found in the soil uh, in, in the ranges of kilograms to the hectare in terms of available zinc, available copper, uh, it's not unusual to find 20 kilograms of copper available in the soil, uh, for example, in an acre. 
Oh, but micronutrients are going to be available in grams to the acre. Oh, okay. They're very tiny amounts. Um, there are, some of them are essential. Some of them, we don't know if they're essential or not. Uh, like iodine. Uh, is it essential for the plants to grow? I don't know. But it sure is essential for human beings to take up a few molecules of it here and there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So uh, you can get the micronutrients out of kelp. And it's probably a good idea to fold your feed kelp. Uh, um, if you're rich, uh, uh, if you've got plenty of money, you can afford to buy kelp meal and put it into your soil. Um, if you don't have that kind of money, you can put a bowl of kelp meal on your table and use it as seasoning. <laughs> so, okay. um, are you? But are you basically getting at that to get the kind of results that you've seen anecdotally in your garden? You need to go towards uh, these synthetic products. Ah, uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> synthetic. Uh, You've just raised a, a major question here. I didn't know if you planned to go here today. Well, I mean, but, you and I have actually discussed before. I, I have a sense from reading your stuff and also talking to you that, that you, um, you know, you, you find it uh, a bit of a false um, – uh, the kind of yeah, a false distinction between what we consider, you know, synthetic and therefore not allowed in organics, and what we consider natural and allowed in organics. So we've we've kind of we've been there before. I, I but but still, it's a, it is a distinction in the sense that those of us who are certified organic have no choice. Um, well, yeah, you, the certified organic grower is in a is a peculiar position. Um, if somebody like me uh, who pretends to have the, the qualifications and authorities to tell you what to do, a soil analyst, in other words. Okay. So if I tell a certified grower that their soil needs zinc because of a soil test, then that grower is allowed to spread zinc sulfate. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. But if I tell the grower that, their soil might need zinc, copper, boron, and manganese, so I'm going to give you a fertilizer that's got a little zinc, copper, manganese, and boron, you know, sulfates and, and, and whatever. You can't use it. You're right. As long as, you know, uh, I mean, the, for, the, the formalization of that is if I have a soil test that says I need it, then I can use it. That's right. Now, I don't know how that might extend to foliars. If I told you your soil needed zinc, um, you probably could get the certification uh, rabbi to agree that, yes, well, you could foliar your feet instead of putting it into the soil. That would be okay. But anyway, back to the main point. Uh, you really think you really hit kind of effective levels when you when you move to stuff like the triple ten or the triple seven, that sort of thing. If Yeah, you could use those as a standard of, you know, the, the, the right zone of the concentration to get to when you're dealing with foliars. Wow, can you hear that? I sure can. Yeah, I can. It sounds uh, yeah. pretty intense. Wait, wait a second. I'm sorry. Uh, what, Annie? Yeah, it is really bucketing down here. Ha! <laughs> okay, sorry about that. That's okay. I think you could do editing. <laughs> Annie was worried that something would get damaged out there. She came in and said, what about this? What about that? Anyway, it'll be all right. Okay, well, we're, we can... Where, where are we now? Well, I think, I, think, uh, I think I've got what I need of that topic to edit. <laughs> well, that ended rather abruptly. So like I said, we didn't quite get to everything that we should have, and I apologize for that, but that wasn't bad. And that's the end of the episode. So I will try and talk to you in about a week, uh, but as I explained up top... And it's going to be a little rough and tumble. But the episodes are coming. Have faith, folks. Who am I kidding? I squandered your faith a long time ago. All right. Talk to you soon. Like it was meant to be. I don't fret, honey. I've got a plan to make our final escape. All we'll need is each other a hundred dollars and maybe a roll of duct tape.
and we'll run right outside of the city's reaches. We'll live off chestnut spring water and peaches. We'll owe nothing to this world of thieves and live life like it was meant to be. Because why would we live in a place that don't want us? A place that is trying to bleed us dry. We could be happy with life in the country. With salt on our skin and the dirt on our hands. I've been doing a lot of thinking some real soul searching and here's my final resolve i don't need a big old house or some fancy car to keep my love going strong so we'll run right out into the wilds and graces we'll keep close quarters with gentle faces and live next door to the birds and the bees and live life like it was meant to be